Good morning. Thanks for showing up so early for the first round of talks. Um, this is the talk about effective Qt. Uh, my name is Mark Mutz. I work for KDAP, uh, one of the sponsors. And um, I've started this as a blog series in 2010. And uh, after I got my, ch my son, kind of went away for a while. And now I'm trying to get back on with this. Um, so what's in it for today? Um, we'll start pretty easy with uh, a comparison between the C++ 11 range 4 and the q 4 each macro. Um, then we will see a tale from the C language, mystery, and uh, four strings to a bow. Before I continue, um, who of you has uh, experience, working experience with Qt? That is good. Uh, for the others, <laughs> just hang on. <laughs> uh, if there's something like a class or so you don't know, ask your neighbor. Uh, if he doesn't know, ask me. So range four versus Q for each. So the standard says that this form of for loop means it's exactly the same as this. So you take the expression, you bind it to a universal reference, um, or forwarding reference. Um, then you take um, iterators from begin and end. That's not exactly true. The standard <clears throat> has wording where you don't require those library functions, um, but this is good enough. And then you iterate over it, and um, for each iteration, you declare a new variable by, and initialize it by dereferencing um, the iterator. And then you execute a statement. So let's for a moment assume that we use the very common declaration const auto reference, intending, of course, to iterate over a container without modifying its elements. So if v is const standard vector int, what is b? Come on, this had nothing to do with Qt. So if I'm iterating over a const standard vector, if I call begin of vector, what is returned? What type? Const iterator, exactly. Which kind of fits? What if v is standard vector, non-const? What is b then? An iterator, non-const iterator. Do we have any problems with this? The answer is no. <laughs> we, we cannot possibly modify the uh, container because we are binding to a const reference of the elements. So we cannot modify it through the, without const cast, of course. Um, we cannot modify the elements, and we don't have access to the actual iterators. Those iterator variables are just for exposition. You don't have access to them from within a range for loop. So no, we cannot change the container. Everything is good. Now, what happens if we do the same with a Q vector of int? So. If v is a const q vector of int, what is b? It's not a trick question. Const iterator. And if v is a non-const vector of int, OK, it seems it's a bit too early. It's an iterator. Do we have a problem? Who thinks we have a problem now? Oh, that's good. <laughs> because then you're learning something in this talk. So remember that Q vector is a implicitly shared type. So if I copy a Q vector, I'm actually not copying the data like I do with standard vector. I just copy a pointer to the data and up a reference count. So what happens if I call begin on a Q vector which is shared it makes a deep copy. 
because it needs to assure that if I iterate over the new copy, over this, this, this copy, all other copies are not affected by me modifying elements, copy on write. It's a bit more complicated for containers because I need to copy before I write. Even if I don't write to the container, the simple fact that I take an iterator out of the container through which I could modify the container is enough for the container to detach, meaning it makes a deep copy. Not always, because maybe you can assure that there is only one container. There is no copy of that container anywhere, if it's a member variable that you never hand out, for example. But in general, this detaches, and detach is bad, especially because you don't see it. This is perfectly okay code, except it's not if your container, if your Qt container is not const, either by having a const reference to it or by being wrapped with standard C ref or by being declared const. Because you can never know whether it does not do a deep copy, and nobody wants to make a deep copy of a container just to iterate over it. That's expensive. It's memory allocation, at least one. So, and that is true, it detaches even though I say const auto e. Because by the time I do that declaration inside the for loop, it's already too late. The problem begins, no pun intended, here, where I call begin e, uh, begin r. There it detaches. So let's have a look at Q for each. That's a macro. Um, so you can use it in C++ 98 just as well. Q for each copies the container unconditionally. And then it iterates over the copy. Something that we just said you shouldn't do and nobody ever wants to do, but I said deep copy. And this is just a shallow copy, at least for cute containers. Cute containers, when copied, remember, they don't copy the data. They copy a pointer to the data and up the reference count. That's still more expensive than doing nothing. Um, but it's almost free for cute containers because they employ a copy on write. It has some advantages in the sense that it's more secure. You can do anything to the underlying container. You can remove elements. You can insert elements inside the loop because you're iterating over a copy. You're not affecting the actual container that you're iterating over. So it's kind of safe, but you pay dearly for that safety. If you actually modify the container, you always have a copy, so you always detach, even if, if you had used a normal for loop uh, with normal iterators, you would not necessarily detach because you might be sh you might have ensured that there is no copy of that container. But since Q4 each takes a copy, there always is a copy. Um, I should repeat here that you should never ever manipulate your container while iterating. It's something that you always do badly. Um, me too, of course, and that's why uh, Alex Stepanov wrote uh, that nice collection of algorithms called the STL. Uh, if you want to remove certain elements and you do it naively by iterating over it and calling erase, 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 you have a quadratic algorithm for most containers. If you use standard remove if, you do it in linear time. That's just an aside. So what ha works for Qt containers reasonably well is horribly and horribly expensive for STL containers because STL containers, when copied, always deep copy. STL containers, including standard string in C++11, are required not to implement cow, copy on write. So whenever you copy an STL container, it's always copied. And as I said, you never ever want to copy a con deep copy a container just to iterate over it. That's just mind-bogglingly stupid. But that's exactly what happens each time you use Q for each or for each, the one without the Q underscore, all over an STL container. 
So to summarize, um, we have uh, four situations for the containers. We have const STL containers, we have mutable STL containers, we have const cute containers, and we have cute containers that are mutable. If we iterate over it with this const looking for loop, everything is okay except here for cute, where we have this potential container deep copy. Can be solved by assigning the container to a const reference or wrapping in standard C ref or just declaring the container const. What you also can do with a C++11 range for, which you cannot do with a Q for each, is change the elements by assigning to a non-const auto variable. That, of course, does not work for const containers. Well, it will probably work, but the auto will adopt the const. Um, but it's okay for both STL and Qt containers. It, Qt containers will detach, but they need to detach because you're modifying the elements. So there everything is okay. But for Q, for each, this is yellow because it's conditionally bad. This is unconditionally bad. It always copies, deep copies. So never ever use Q for each on STL containers. Um, but you can use it on cute containers. And on mutable cute containers, it's actually better because it does not copy. It does not deep copy. Um, questions so far? That was pretty easy. So let's look back a bit in time to C. Who was programming C before he was programming C++? Quite a few people. So most of you will probably know this. In C, how would you grow an array of heap allocated objects? Or a heap array of objects? You would allocate it with malloc, sure. How would you grow it? Like if you add more stuff, don't answer because I have so would you use malloc for allocating a new buffer and then the for loop to copy the stuff over? Probably not. But that's exactly what standard vector does, right? Even in C++11, it allocate, if it needs to grow, it allocates a new buffer, copies or moves elements over from the old to the new buffer, and then it has more capacity and it destroys the old buffer. So something that we always do in C++, but we would never do in C. Hmm. Or we could use malloc and memcopy. It's basically the same, except memcopy is the same function for all types. So we might save some code size. Or, anyone else got an idea? Realloc, exactly. Realloc. How about not copying at all? That would be cool. So what is realloc? The realloc function changes the size of the memory block pointed to, by the pointer you pass it, to size bytes. It can be larger or smaller. And the contents in the overlapping region, so minimum of old and new size, are unchanged bit for bit. And the new area, if there is new area, is uninitialized. Wouldn't it be nice if standard vector or Q vector would use that to grow? I mean, not copying is better than copying or even moving, let alone the double buffers that are required to be held from the heap at the same time. But does that actually work for all types? Are all types reallocable? What about this one? We have a key value pair, and the default would be that um, key and value are pointers to heap allocated strings. But since we expect that most of those are rather small, we have some scratch buffer here into which we can point them so we don't need a small, uh, we don't need uh, to allocate um, heap from the heap for small objects. Uh, you might squirt at this, this is used in C++, in C libraries. 
Is it reallocable? No. Why not? Exactly. Not copying the data doesn't mean it does not move in memory. If uh, the memory subsystem cannot grow that buffer, one thing it can do, is it can copy, but we want not copy, it can remap that memory region to another region where there is space to grow, and then just add more pages to it. But since we are self-referential here, have pointers into ourselves, that does not work. Uh, what about this one? I have some type, and it has an um, array of type pointers called children. Is type a reallocable type? Exactly. If they are in an array, no. Why? Because the address is the identity of the object. And if I move an object in memory, all the references to it, all the pointers to it go stale. It has nothing to do with the type itself only to do with how I use the type. If I say a pointer to an object identifies that object, then I can no longer use a container that reallocates with realloc. Well, I cannot put it in any container, but, you know. Um, what about this type? Again, key value pair, but uh, this time we have uh, attributes for a comma separated list of attributes. Is that reallocable? Yeah, sure it is. It has, it's not self referential, and um, I don't see anywhere here where the type would be, uh, where the address of the type would be used as, a, uh, as an as the identity. This is a value type, and everything is contained in itself and not self-referential. Perfectly reallocable. Back to C++. What about this type? Pimpled, D-pointer, Shazaiah cat, compiler firewall, however you want to name it. Are those types Reallocable. Exactly. Radio Yerevan, it depends. Is it self referential? Maybe the private class has a back pointer to the type, to the public class, which is not unheard of. Most of the Q object hierarchy has it. Or the address could form the identity. Again, Q object. The objects are identified by their address. They are aggregated into parent-child relationships by their address. Or it could be something like QString, which is also pimpled, but it doesn't have back references. It's a pure value type, so perfectly okay to reallocate it. The point is, if you cannot tell from the class definition, how should the compiler be able to tell? And the answer is it cannot. Remember this one. Those structs are identical. The compiler doesn't care whether I write this comment or that comment. Also doesn't care whether the, that array is called attributes or underscore scratch. It's exactly the same array, uh, it's the same struct for the, for the compiler. And one, remember, this one was not reallocable, this was re reallocable. So how should the compiler tell? It cannot. By definition, it cannot, because it's about the semantics and not about the structure of a type. So let's introduce something better than reallocable. Um, 
This is usually called trivially relocatable. That term comes from the EASTL, the Electronic Arts version of the STL, which has, um, we will see, an optimization for this. So a type is trivially relocatable if it can be moved in memory with memcopy. And moved here has nothing to do with C++11 move semantics, because in C++11 move semantics, you move an object, you create a new one, and you need to still destroy the old one. This is more like the destructive move, which is discussed for standardization. It's you take an object, you copy it, and then you forget about the old one. You don't run, in particular, you don't run the destructor on it. That is what is meant. In other words, when, is, when can you copy a type with memcopy when it's not self-referential and if the address does not fa form part of its identity. In particular, that is false for almost all polymorphic types. <clears throat> but many, many C and C++ types are actually trivially relocatable, including and especially all those copy and write types and standard vector. Some myth busting here. From if a type is a pod, that does not mean it's trivially relocatable. Yeah, our two cons car star, cons car star character array structs, they are pods, but they are not trivially relocatable. Also, if you have a trivially copyable type, that does not mean that it's trivially relocatable. Again, those two structs that we saw with the key value pairs, they are trivially copyable as C structs, as all C structs are. But they are not trivially relocatable. Of course, if you would copy them trivially, you would also make a mistake. But trivially copyable is not about semantics. It's simply about the structure of the type. It does not say, is it actually safe to do the copy? It only says, can you copy this with memcopy? Or does the compiler copy it with memcopy if the compiler copies it? So, and why is that so? The compiler cannot tell, as we've seen, whether a type is trivially relocatable or not. Ergo, any type trait that you throw at it, which the compiler evaluates, cannot possibly tell that it's trivially relocatable. Of course, you can tell for a certain fixed subset of types. So if you take um, all the built-in types, you will find a type trait that maps all um, the all the built-in types to true and all the non-built-in types to false. And of course, that implies if it's built-in type, it's trivially relocatable. But not for user-defined types. You cannot write such a type trait. So what now? As the class author, you need to manually mark up your types which begs the question, how do you do that? And the answer depends on what do you use. Um, I will pick three examples, the STL, the EA STL, and Qt itself. In the STL, eh, there is no such thing. In the EA STL, you have a macro to do it. EA STL, declare trivially relocate, and you pass your type name. And in Qt, it's a tiny bit more complicated um, because you first need to enter the Qt namespace, which is optional, but uh, nobody uses it, but still to be on the correct side, you need to enter it. Then you can declare the type info as movable type, and then you exit the namespace. If you don't do this, with types that are held in Qt containers, you're not getting the maximum performance. And I mean, it looks daunting, but it's not. It's always the same. 
The only problem is to decide whether the type is actually movable. So as container authors, how can I use that information? I use type traits to check whether a type is trivially relocatable and then I can perform certain operations differently based on that information. In the STL, of course, again, no type trait, no optimization. In EASTL, you would use the type trait has trivial relocate. And in Qt, again, it's a bit more complicated. <laughs> um, the new way is to use Qt type info query and ask for the is relocatable attribute before Qt 5.6, which is not released yet. Uh, you would have to say not is static. Uh, don't ask about that static. I never understood what that is supposed to mean. But um, just the new one is much nicer, of course. So how, so Qt declare type info. We saw already that uh, you can declare your types uh, Q movable type, but that's not the only thing that you can do. Uh, you can also declare them complex or primitive. Complex is the default. It just means no information, no optimizations. Assume the worst. Primitive means it's trivially relocatable, trivially copyable, and every bit pattern is a valid object. So a pointer variable is not primitive type. It's marked as primitive type. Who cares? Uh, because um, all containers zero initialize all primitive types. Um, but from the pure standpoint of what primitive type is supposed <laughs> to mean, every bit, bit pattern needs to be a valid object. For example, a point of two ints. You can stuff any bits in there and it will be a valid point. And valid object. Valid point might be something different. So how do Qt containers use this information? In QVector, um, realloc is used for trivially relocatable types. It's exactly what we wanted to achieve um, in the beginning. Wouldn't it be nice if standard vector, no, QVector, yes, would use that, but you need to mark your types up explicitly for this optimization to take effect. Is it an optimization? Yes. Um, and it doesn't run constructors and destructors for primitive types. So if you mark up your type primitive, the container assumes that if it allocates some memory, it does not need to initialize it before it can assign into the slots new values and it will not run the de destructors when it deallocates something. Qvariant uh, saves one indirection for trivially relocatable types, and it doesn't run the destructor for primitive types. And then QList. Um, I wrote here QList vector mode and QList array list mode. Anyone has any idea what this is all about? Yeah, that is. Um, Yeah. You don't know, in general, except you, you, plural, don't know what a queue list is. You don't know. If you make queue list of T, it intricately depends on T what a queue list is. Is it a vector? Layout compatible with queue vector? That's one option. Is it a vector layout incompatible with queue vector or C array? It's also a possibility. Or is it an array of pointers to heap allocated objects? Also a possibility. Of course, any complexity guarantees that you give, like the standard SDL gives, 
are completely moot if you don't even know whether your elements are allocated in one big buffer or in several small heap allocations. The rule is kind of simple for the compiler to check, but pretty hard for developers to check. The rule is QList uses vector-like mode when the type is trivially relocatable. So for your own types, unless you mark them up as movable, QList will always be an array list. Or if the end, if the size of their type is smaller than a void star, smaller or equal. If it's equal, you have the same structure as Q vector. You have slots of size void star into which the objects are placed. If it's strictly smaller than a void star, you have objects, padding, object, padding, because the slots are always void star sized. So if you have a queue list of bool on a 64-bit platform, instead of fitting 64 bools into a cache line, you only fit eight with a queue list. Best suggestion, don't use queue list. It's a bit hard because it's used all over the API, but in your own code, just don't use queue list. And of course, if uh, any of those is not true, then it's an array list mode with much less performance, of course, because it heap allocating every single element. So um, if you're in vector mode, you have one in direction and one heap allocation saved per element inserted. And both of them don't run constructors, destructors for primitive types. So again, back to Q declare type, yeah? Both need to be true. Yeah. Because QList reallocates the buffer, that one big buffer, in which it either holds those elements or in which it holds the pointers to the elements, always with realloc. Um, that way, QList can um, share all the memory management between all QList instances. That does not necessarily mean that it takes less CPU cycles or less um, e executable code to perform these things, but it was one of the design goals that you move memory management into a non-template class and all the template classes would use the same. So another detour to Q declare type info, because QList changes the memory layout <coughs> depending on whether you declare a type that is smaller or equal size to a void star, it changes the memory layout if you mark it movable or not. You cannot, in general, mark a type movable after it has been released. So if you are in a project like Qt itself or KDE, where you need to keep binary compatibility, or if you're linking against a um, Qt library that is commercial where you don't have the source code, you cannot change the type um, identification, the type info after it was first compiled with another compiler or another by another person. Because QList actually changes the memory layout. In Q vector, that's not a problem. Whether one Q vector calls malloc and copies the elements over and the other one uses realloc does not matter. But in QList, the memory layout changes, the physical layout of the class. So we need something like trivially relocatable, but don't tell QList because we want that optimization for Qvector and Qvariant, which, by the way, does not have that problem because Qvariant is out of line. No. Qlist as a template is all inline code. So we need something like that, um, but for Qlist, and that's called Q-relocatable type. It's also new in 5.6. And that means it's trivially relocatable, but except Qlist does not use that information. And it's purely a binary compatibility crutch. 
you can you only need to use this if you are in a project in which you hold the types in Qvector, Qvariant, and Qlist, and you don't want Qlist to change binary incompatibility. So summary. Mark your own types with qdeclare meta type t, comma what, where what can be any of complex, the default. Movable means trivially relocatable, or primitive is something like trivially copyable, but not quite. This is used by QList, QVector, QVariant, and others. And uh, in general, beware that changing the type classification of a type is, leads to binary incompatibility issues with especially QList. Questions to this? Yeah. Uh, so if you're writing thinking that if you declare it as relocatable rather than movable, it, you get the, the meta type info, you get is relocatable set to true, but is static will also be set to true. Yeah. So one check, the, the new check. Exactly. Check this is precisely why we now have a different way of querying the type infos. So if you have a Q-relocatable type, this is true, and this whole expression is false, which means static is still true. If you mark it movable, this and this are both true. Yeah. And uh, the simple fact is that Qlist is checking this and Qvector is checking this. Other questions? Okay, so um, the next section is about strings. In particular, it's about how do I come from the left side to the right side. So on the left side, I have a const character array, a C string literal, and on the right side, I have a UTF-16 encoded container, variable length container called QString. So how do I get from one to side to the next? So there are many different ways. Uh, here are five. So which one is better? Don't answer, it's a trick question. Uh, I can call a function that takes a QString with a C string literal. I can call it uh, with QString from Latin one. I can call it with uh, that string literal uh, wrapped or passed first to TR. I can pass it to, through Q Latin one string or Q, through Q string literal. If I don't pass to a function, if I assign to a Q string, which one is better now? Don't answer trick question. Or if I append to a Q string, which one is better then? Or if I create a temporary string by concatenating an existing string with a literal, what should I use then? And what does better actually mean? Does it mean less to type or more readable? Or is it better for internationalization? Or does it lead to smaller executable size? Or is it faster? Or is it safer? Without defining what better means, there's no sense in recommending one over the other. So let's look at each of them in turn and describe them so that you can, at the end of this talk, make your own informed judgments. So let's, looking, let's look at passing to a function. If I pass a string literal to a function, a C string literal to a function that takes a Q string, uh, unless you do certain, define certain macros, it compiles. And what it will do is it will implicitly convert the const character star um, or const character array to a queue string. That involves memory allocation. It's perfectly readable, a little to type. Um, it's implemented under the hood as calling QString from UTF-8, so you can pass in Q, UTF-8 uh, stuff uh, in Qt5. Qt assumes that your source code is formatted in UTF-8. 
So all the default 8-bit to Q-string conversions are using from UTF-8. So that always allocates memory. And it always goes through the rather expensive UTF-8 decoding, even if your string is ASCII. On the positive side, it expands to very little code because that's an out-of-line function call. It can deal with Unicode, so it's okay-ish for internationalization. Um, and you can disable this with those macros. How about appending a C string literal? There's direct support for this in String Builder, and you should always use String Builder in your projects. Um, look up the documentation, how to see how to enable it. It's very readable, it's little to type, um, but it's also again implemented as QString from UTF-8. It has a US ASCII fa fast path, but the compiler doesn't see it because it's out of line. So it may allocate memory, or it may not. If it's purely ASCII, it will not allocate memory, except as it um, creates the new string. Um, if it's uh, not ASCII, it will allocate memory. So it's always at least potentially going into the expensive UTF-8 decoding. On the positive side, very little in code and data size because it's out of line function call. It's okay for Unicode, so okay for internationalization. And this too you can disable with cute no cast from ASCII. From Latin 1 is a bit simpler. It's an explicit conversion. So the previous one was implicit. This one is explicit. So explicit is usually good from const character star to qstring. But if you, wherever you need to create a qstring from a character literal, you need to use qstring from Latin 1 with the qstring colon colon usually needs to be appended, prepended. Lots to type and poor readability. It always allocates memory, but the decoding is pretty cheap because Latin 1 to UTF-16 decoding is just inserting null bytes every second element, basically converting an array of unsigned characters to an array of unsigned short. It's an out-of-line function call, so it's uh, cheap on the code and data size. It's not internationalization safe because it does not deal with arbitrary Unicode. And the simple fact is that you should avoid it. There's nothing that speaks for it. So um, the same is true for appending. So just from Latin 1, from UTF-8, just try not to use it at all. What about TR? TR is also an explicit conversion from a const character star to a Q string, but it's much less to type. And it's implemented as hash lookup. So uh, TR, of course, is short for translate. It's a function, static function that is defined in all Q object subclasses by the Q object macro. And uh, that is read by L update from the source code into an XML file and then can be translated and the translations can be loaded at runtime. Um, but since it's very convenient to use, um, it's uh, very readable. People get used to it, Qt developers get used to it very quickly and it's very little to type. It always allocates memory but it needs to be because it returns a different string from in general, from what is being passed, translated string. It's out of line, so that's also good. It's perfect for, UTF, uh, for internationalization because it not only works with Unicode, it supports localization, translation. And always use this function for user visible strings, even if you never intend to translate your application because it's by far the shortest form of transforming a string literal into a Q string. This, however, is a complete no-no. If you have translators that uh, actually have any kind of power over you, you will get kicked in the butt if you do this. 
Why? It prevents translators from rearranging the sentence structures. Not all languages have the same syntax rules. That leads to different orders in different languages. Don't have an example for that because all languages that I speak have basically the same grammar. But um, <clears throat> there are languages where you would, where a translator would re like to rearrange things around, and it cannot if you simply concatenate strings. So you should use tr and qstring arg instead. For so example, like this, you put in a placeholder, and the placeholder can be moved by the translator wherever he wants it to be. And then on the translated um, string, still containing the placeholder, you can then call .arg to replace the argument into the string. If you do this with multiple arguments, strongly prefer multi-arg over arg chaining, because this has several problems. One of it is that it permanently returns a temporary queue string and then performs the next substitution. The other is if this is a string, and uh, v1 contains itself a percent n, the next one will replace at the wrong position. It's kind of a format string vulnerability. So don't do this. Um, three Q strings uh, are created and you have a potential security problem. Uh, better to do this. Only works on Q strings arguments, so you need to convert them to Q strings yourself. But then it goes through with what just one pass and you don't have that problem that if v1 contains a percent one um, the replacement of v2 will be performed in at the wrong position so this was like okay now comes the main part uh, the distinction between q latin one string and q string literal if you use qt creator you think uh, this should be trivial because if you have a string literal and you press uh, alternate return on it, it tells you, should I wrap this in qString literal for Qt5, or should I wrap this into qLatin1 string for Qt4? Of course, Qt creator is just a dumb machine, and here it's lying to you outrightly, because that's not at all how you should use it. Um, so, QLatin's one string is an explicit conversion from const character star to a QString, in this case, if you pass it to a function. It's not so readable. Um, that's a disadvantage. But on the plus side, it's just a separate type that stores a pointer and a length. Yeah, so you can declare variables of type QLatin uh, Q one string. It's not a macro or something. It never allocates memory by itself because it's just storing what you pass it. Uh, there's no decoding whatsoever because it assumes that what you pass it, contrary to the Qt coding conventions, which call for UTF-8 formatted input, this expects Latin 1 formatted input. Easy to solve with octal or hex escape sequences. Little code and data size, everything is inline, everything is const expression in that class. Doesn't work with internationalization, but a lot of strings that you use in your application don't need to be localized. So I said it does not allocate, and that is only true if you don't take a Q string, Q Latin one string, and as the next step convert it into a Q string that will, of course, allocate. But many functions that take a QString are overloaded on QLatin1 string, and if the implementation is any good, they will preserve the QLatin1 stringness of the argument and not at the first time, at the first opportunity, convert it into QString. So they will actually save that allocation that you would otherwise have. But take care that not all <coughs> functions taking QString are overloaded on QLatin1 string. If you call a function that is not overloaded on QLatin one string, it will compile, it will implicitly convert to QString, and it will allocate. So be on the outlook for that. If you write your own function that takes a QString, when should you provide a QLatin one string overload? 
if you have a faster, in particular, a non-allocating implementation. Yeah? So if I'm writing QString contains, quite obviously I don't need to have an actual QString. I can compare the U shorts with the U chars directly. So I don't need to create an actual QString just to be able to compare. Also, if you provide a Q Latin one string overload, never ever delegate to the QString overload. That makes no sense at all, except during <laughs> development and test, of course. Because the pure existence of a Q Latin one string overload means I have a faster path in my implementation for Q Latin one strings. And if I convert internally to a Q-string, I'm lying to the user. Don't <laughs> lie to your users. So always use this when passing C-string literals to functions overloaded on Q-string, q, -string, q -latin one string That includes the equality operators, starts with, ends with, appending, contains, even though that is currently cool, poorly implemented because it actually does convert to UTF-16 internally, but that's an implementation detail. It needs to be fixed. It's not something that you as an app user need to be concerned about. Um, for appending with operator plus, uh, there's a Q string builder fast path. It's all in line. The compiler has all the information it never allocates in uh, memory with QString Builder. So that is one of the most important things to remember that if you use QString Builder to um, concatenate uh, substrings into a larger whole, always pass, um, if you can, with QLatin1 string. That's by far the fastest, uh, the only non out of line way to append with QString Builder. Yeah, and always use when passing C string literals to QString Builder. So, what about QString literal, which is supposed to be the new thing, better thing? It's also explicit conversion from const character start to UTF 16, but crucially, oh, poor readability, crucially, it's at compile time. QString literal creates. <coughs> A static storage duration, Q string, as far as that is possible, and puts it into your row data, rommable data. Already decoded into UTF 16. Sounds good. So it never allocates memory because the actual conversion from that thing to a Q string is reseating a pointer not even adjusting a reference count because that stuff is residing in rommable memory, so you cannot adjust something in there. It has a special value for the reference count that needs to be checked, but it just copies a pointer. So the UTF-8 decoding is performed by the compiler at compile time. However, this leads to a larger code size. The compiler can optimize the construction by just loading a pointer but it does not see that it uh, can remove the QString destructor. So whenever you create a QString ritual, the compiler will emit an out-of-line call to the QString destructor, because it cannot see that it shouldn't. Um, it also leads to larger data size because it does not store 8-bit character strings, but 16-bit character strings, plus the size, plus allocation size, plus other stuff that's in the header of the QString private class. And, of course, it supports Unicode, so it's a somewhat internationalization safe. How is this stuff implemented? It's a lambda function. It's a macro containing a lambda function that has a static struct that is the same uh, memory compatible with the what QString uses at runtime to store its thing in, and it has a special value for the reference count that says never deallocate this. But by using lambda functions, you have two disadvantages. The first one, you need lambda functions. 
and not all compilers have them yet. And even if you have them, every lambda function is a separate entity. If I used the exact same lambda function, token for token identical, in two different functions, and pass them, for example, to standard sort, I will have two completely different standard sort implementations because the types of the lambdas are different. Each lambda, at least in each different function, in separate functions, is a different uh, type. Some compilers try to fold back the binary code, um, thereby violating that different functions should have different start addresses, um, which is a different uh, topic. Um, but be aware that if you use QString literal, the data is duplicated for basically each invocation because it's using numbers. So no sharing of identical QString literals across functions. No sharing with equivalent C string literals. So you get potentially lots of duplicated string data. And most definitely no sharing of common suffixes, which you can get with, uh, with the C strings. If you have hello world and world as, as um, character arrays, most compilers, at least within the same translation unit, and most linkers, will fold them together, which is one of the things where uh, the standard explicitly allows that um, objects may overlap, which is otherwise forbidden. And so I said, you need lambda functions. So what, do I get a compile error when I don't have lambda functions? No, that's the worst part. You don't. You just silently invoke from UTF-8 which is completely opposite of what you wanted to achieve with QString literal, because you, with QString literal you wanted no allocations and no transformation of 8-bit data to UTF-16 data at runtime. You wanted this all to be done at compile time, and now suddenly you get the most expensive way to create a QString from an 8-bit character literal from UTF-8, hidden in what should be non-throwing, non-allocating, uh, just a pointer move. MSVC has uh, a special case. It still needs lambdas, but lambdas were introduced in Visual Studio, I think, in 2010. Uh, so that is not the problem. The problem is that uh, if you have, uh, if you don't have Unicode string literals, where you can actually plug something before the string literal and have the compiler turn it into a character 16T string, um, you cannot create that string in memory at compile time. And in Windows, uh, WCART has size 2. So it is the same as a character 16T. And therefore, um, on Windows, that works. On Unix, WCART is uh, 4 bytes wide, so you cannot use it. And if you create a QString literal, its capacity will always be the same as the size. That's also true if you can construct a Q-string from a Q um, Latin 1 string. But here, because you have a Q-string already, it's bad for, if you call a non-const function on it, it will detach. Yeah. Any non-const function will make a deep copy. So how about QStringBuilder? QStringBuilder does not have a special um, pa code path for QString literals. Oh my god, it's so late. <coughs> should have warned me. Um, it just uses the QString. QString literal is a lambda function which returns a QString. So that means the size info is probably lost for most compilers. It's an out-of-line QString. Uh, destructor cluttering the code. So strongly prefer QLite and one string. I already said that. This I will skip. So use QString literal only when you use a fully conforming C11 compiler on all your platforms. The function you're passing the C string literal to doesn't overload on QLite and one string. The string coming from the QString literal will not often 
will not, or not often, or not soon have non-cons member functions called upon it. The string will not be handed out of the library. This is, has to do with the previous slide. You can read about it when I've uploaded the slides. It uh, has something to do with plugins that get unloaded and the string data that may be referenced elsewhere in the system is gone after plugin unloading. And um, you can use it when the string is actual Unicode. Basic otherwise use Qlate and one string, especially in C++ 98 mode. And if the function you're passing the string literal to has an overload on QLAT and one string, that includes especially QString builder. Or if the string coming from QLAT and one string will have non cons member functions called on it. This is weird. Why do I say use QLAT and one string to construct a QString if later you call a um, mutable member function on it and not QString literal, which already is a QString? But the Q-string will detach too. So you win nothing except that you need to copy the data twice or the same number of times except uh, the first source is 16-bit array and the other source is an 8-bit array. You copy the data anyway. You make an allocation anyway. <clears throat> and as a general guideline, strongly prefer to use Q-string builder. This is the last slide, don't worry over, if you cannot use QString Builder, use operator plus equals, but you start with an empty QString. Because then the first one will reserve already excess capacity and with a bit of luck, the next one is probably free. If you do this, this will allocate, but the capacity will be equal to the size, so the next step you still need to reallocate. So it gives you nothing. Good. Thanks. Sorry for running over, as always seem to do. Um, questions? Yeah. Just Wait for the microphone, UTF please. Oh, uh, why wouldn't QString just store UTF-8? Like, is there a compatibility issue, or what is it? Um, there were tries to do this. I did not partake in those tries. I recently, very recently, uttered on the mailing list the expectation that since I saw branches flying around that said QString UTF-8, uh, that there were considerations to do this for Qt6. But Tiago, the maintainer, said no. And uh, basically, um, it's historical reasons. Um, they don't feel comfortable changing it in such a central part, even though Mozilla, for example, has shown that they uh, save, what, 30% in string data when they uh, use UTF-8 encoded data because most of the um, strings that Mozilla, at least, Firefox or Thunderbird, um, operate on are mostly 18 bit, uh, 8 bits because of all the XML markup. Um, but in Qt, uh, it was not so much technically, but politically, this decided that it would be UTF-16. Um, another role that this plays is that um, I think both on Mac on, and on Windows, uh, UTF-16 is the native encoding for the APIs. So the only platform that would benefit from it is Unix, where the native encoding these days is UTF-8. But, I mean, for Qt, Windows and Mac OS are much more important than Unix. Other questions? If that is not the case, then I thank you again. And